Welcome back to another hour of Scotch Hour. I am Noah. And I'm Jesse. Well, hopefully everyone had a great week last week and you got the uh, double dose of our two drops of our last two episodes, which I do apologize for getting those out late. However, I believe with this episode, we have another great episode lined up for you. Um, we are going to be tasting the Ben Riak Peated uh, Cask uh, Strength, right? Batch number two. Batch number two. All right. I'm excited for this one. Dude. You said it's 60. Oh, yeah. 60. 60% ABV. Oh, wow. Getting lit. Getting lit. Yeah. Or, or, or Oloroso Sherry and, and bourbon. bourbon cask. Yeah, baby. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, we have our shout outs and get it togethers as well as uh, our uh, restaurant review of the Lazy Dog. Oh, my God. <laughs> no. And um, our Smarty Challenge, which was to watch. The uh, Time Machine movie. 2002. 2002 version. Guy and then, Pierce. Yep. Mm. And then also talk about like if there was a particular point in time in history, which era would we like to visit? Scotch review. All right, uh, the Ben Riakas. This one also done by Rachel Berry, who has delighted us with the Ben Riach 10, the Ben Riach Smoky 10, the Ben Riach 12, and the Ben Riach Smoky 12. All have been great. Um, from beginning to later, the 10 really reminded us of Honey, as I called it, my Honey Rider, and the 12. Uh, James really, Bond episode. Yeah, oh, hell yeah. Uh, the the uh, 12 really just added some uh, smoke and some peat. We went into, or the uh, 10, the Smoky 10, we went into the 12, and the original 12, I think he called it best, man. When you get that that scent, that nose of blueberry, followed by just honey and sweetness and um, really biscuit, uh, it was that was bomb. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievably it was the bomb. Uh, amazing. And then followed by the smoky twelve, which I think it had some similarities, but with the smoke, it made it more of a blackberry, uh, blackberry flavored deliciousness and so now we're going to one that is not a 10 or a 12 necessarily this is just uh batch number two of the peated cask strength and for anyone who doesn't understand what the whole peated process really involves they take the grain and produce a scotch and then later on peat it and peat really is just a version of grass that's smoked um, including some of that earth that goes with it and that uh, that flavor and nose goes into the scotch before they bottle it they bottle it and it comes out often quite amazing. Now, cask strength is a whole nother level. Um, the fact that it's 60% ABV, I'm guessing it's 10 years or the younger. Why I say that, that's not necessarily true. But why I say that is because the longer you age a scotch, a whiskey, a bourbon, but uh, in this case, this scotch, uh, the more alcohol that will find its ways out of the cracks and the crevices of the barrels or the casks and make its way out. And so the older a scotch gets, ironically, the more, whether it's Ben Riak or any distillery, ages a a scotch a whiskey um the less they have of it to go around so when you take a batch of scotch and five years in you're making a wee beastie you've got most of what you started with when you're trying to do a 60 year Macallan, for example you could literally be down to 10 percent just based on evaporation of the original starting volume so uh, this is going to be a treat for sure yeah, I, th I, I agree to you. I think it's going to be a total treat here. And if, for those of you, if this is your first time watching one of our episodes on uh, um, Ben React, just go to one of our previous episodes and you'll see the history. And it's, we have probably talked about the tours in one of them as well. So That's right. 1898, John Duff established, founded the Ben React Distillery. We went through a ton of owners, as most distilleries have, through Two centuries, some of them in this case, uh, almost a century and a half at this point. At this point, uh, Rachel Berry is the master blender, and she's been doing some great 
things. But again, uh, established in 1898 by John Duff. And with this one, uh, undoubtedly going to be a fun treat. So once again, cask strength. That means as they're removing it from the cask, if it's true cast strength, they're not adding any water. If you guys don't know this, this is like basic science, basic math. Most of the scotches you drink, whiskeys, bourbons, but most of the scotches you drink will be right around the 40 to 43% ABV. To get it there, especially if it's not aged 15 years or longer, they're adding a significant amount of water to the volume to actually reduce its strength, um, to reduce its uh, potency. And again, through the distillation process, and when they're done distilling it, they literally, it's clear. It doesn't have any of this gorgeous color that uh, I imagine this Ben Riach uh, cast strength peated is about to have. No beta males here. No beta males here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're not stiff, you're going to be dead after this one. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, when you said like the, the, you don't lose any potency here. Oh, yeah. I'm talking, you know, you know like beta, beta, beta males eating like the soybean stuff and all that crap, like losing their. Yeah, I don't understand. Losing their swimmers and stuff. Yeah, I don't understand anything <laughs> limp. This is stiff. All right. This is stiff here. All right. Handsome canister, very earthy, perfect sense, peated, really emphasizing that peated with, with a cask kind of three-dimensionally exploded on the canister. And as we open it up, much as expected, handsome bottle, great color, much more, I'm going to use the term masculine, than the other Ben Riak bottles where it's a lighter colored label and it kind of breaks down the different things you can expect. Not that this one doesn't do that in some senses, but maybe this is more traditional, uh, less light. <laughs> a well, bit I, think you're, I think if you look at some of the other Ben Riaks that we uh, tried, their colors have been more close around maybe on a pastel scale where this is actually like looks more like a dark brown. And, yeah, and this is the earth. This is the peat right here. Yep. Rachel Berry, great job once again with some advertising and marketing. All right, man, how long you want to wait? We can keep talking. I say we just pop this open. Yeah, pop the bitch <laughs> open. Uh, Ben Riach, uh, typically on their other bottles, have had a simple symbol on the top of the foil label. This one, BRD, Ben Riach Distillery. Like it. Is it embossed, stamped? Or oh, is it, it is. It's okay. like three-dimensional for sure. Now, they're still going with a wood top above nice. the, the cork, but this... Again, we've talked about that. Spend the extra pennies if you can just to emboss that. I did recently read a study that 30%, it doesn't matter if you're buying a $50 bottle, a $20 bottle, or a $5,000 bottle, 30% of the cost of the scotch ultimately went into marketing and bottling. Wow, I just cannot say enough about this scotch. <laughs> uh, it is incredible. I mean, honestly, here, um, for being in cash rank, being uh, 60 ABV, I honestly thought when I first started to smell it and uh, to analyze the bouquet of it, I thought it was analyze? just... Analyze? <laughs> an analyze. Uh, that reminds me of uh, Arrested <laughs> Development and the guy who drinks that coffee mug says, like, anal rapist. <laughs> Dude, you can't go too soon. Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, as I was uh, stating here, um, I thought when I was uh, smelling the uh, the bouquet of this uh, scotch, I thought it was going to burn my, my 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 nose a little bit because of like the high alcohol content. Talking about wax on the nipples, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also I thought um, you know when I first took my first sip of it, I was expecting it to 
um, be very hot as well due to the uh, high ABV, but it is uh, surprisingly smooth and um, and really the uh, when you smell the bouquet of it, it's, it's not offensive whatsoever. It actually is very inviting. And uh, to kind of first start off here, I do like the color. Uh, like you, I expected the color to actually be slightly bit darker, but it makes sense that if it's not in the in the charred barrels as long, you probably wouldn't get that uh, the darker color. But it still has a nice medium gold to brassy color to it. Um, as far as the bouquet goes, um, I'm getting like smoked peat on the nose. That was like the first thing that I smelled. And then from there, I got like earth tones. Um, and when I, when I talk about earth tones, like uh, like it's almost kind of like what you talk about, like when you talk about earth tones with like a nice great Bordeaux, uh, like a French wine, or even a great Italian wine where you get like some like that tobacco and that like that moss and musky kind of like um, hints there. <clears throat> and then I get like hints of uh, lime or some kind of citrus. Maybe it might be lemon, but I think it's more on the lime side. And uh, also some some brine. You can get some mm. brine in there with uh, hints of vanilla. And uh, honestly, this has this this uh, the nose on this has such complexity that I also believe that probably you'll probably pick up even maybe one or two more hints, um, or things might become more prevalent as it opens up and spends more time um, exposed to the air. Now on. Uh, when I taste it with the palate, the very first thing that I get is brine, mm. which is great because I love the brine Dude, flavor. I'm telling you. <laughs> because I am a big fan of Oban. I do like Talisker, and so I do like that brine flavor. And so that's like the very first thing that I picked up. But from there, it kind of really transitions really nicely into some uh, smoked peat, uh, vanilla, uh, toffee, and almond. And when I'm talking about like toffee and almond, I'm almost – you, you can almost think of like something like close to like a Heath bar. Mm -hmm. And from there you got like, uh, you know, um, that toffee almond and, and basically like cooking cocoa or, or like a dark chocolate almost. Uh, and that's where I'm getting like that kind of whole Heath bar type of like sense there. And there's still, once again, that, that, that minute hint of citrus. And from there on the finish, from the nose to the palate, from the front palate, mid palate, going into the finish on the back part of the palate, totally different because on the on the back part, uh, I'm, I'm, on the finish I'm getting here, is I'm getting a dry, smoky oak with cinnamon sticks and ginger. And it is spicy. Like, you, like... It's nice and complex in the nose. It's nice and complex on the front and mid palate. But in the end, you don't get any of this hint. But also now you get like this, you know, dry, smoky oak with cinnamon and, and ginger. And it's hitting you with that spice right there. And it's not the, it's not that heated spice, you know, like you would think from like a high alcohol content thing. It's that like the cinnamon spice and the ginger spice. And it makes for a nice, great complex scotch with a finish that will have you like saying wow and uh this is a uh, wow i don't know if i <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i would share i don't know if i would take this to like uh a, to a poker game or anything like that because i'm not really sure if i would poker want her game or poker game <laughs> yeah either or uh <laughs> Because I'm not sure if I would really want to share this with a bunch of people. I, I I think this is another one of those ones where I would honestly would rather just share it with other friends or other people who would appreciate a very nice scotch that has great complexity to it. And on uh, some of the price points here, uh, Ooh. Ooh. I, like I've seen anywhere that it, like this bottle goes from somewhere in like like the low hundreds to like. Uh, like uh, to like eighty nine dollars, but oddly enough, we still like we stumbled upon a great deal for it. I, we found it for like fifty four or fifty five dollars before tax uh, on sale, and so that was like a great steal for this bottle. So if you can find that type of price point, hell yeah, you buy as many of these bottles as you possibly can. <laughs> but um, even at like eighty nine dollars, like the ninety dollars, like on the low end on some places, like you get at maybe at maybe at Total Wine. Still buy multiple bottles because this this thing is worth it. And like I said, I like I 
probably would not share it with many people, but only those who would appreciate it. Yeah, for me, this scotch, you know, I want to be like, here's the opposite of what this scotch is. This scotch is good. It's a honey gold color. Now, there's nothing robotic about this scotch at all. It is fun and exciting. This scotch, for me, dark medium gold and that gold is that hay color it's that color where you don't get a whole lot of the after effects of the charred barrels it is more of the peat that is uh, introduced into the scotch and why i say peat is supposed to smoke peat i don't get a ton of smoke in this and i actually like a little bit of smoke in some of the scotches this is one of the things i like about our bag but this is the opposite you get all the peat for me i get all the peat i'm not burdened with the smoke overpowering the peat it's pretty exciting with that right off the bat though besides that medium uh to medium dark gold color that this just makes fun lights up your life on the nose super complex layered just like you said and here's what i'll think i'll say also is man olfactory overload when i introduced it the <laughs> wrong way kind of like when you're uh if you were ever like a 16 year old kid or a 21 year old kid and decided to try a cigarette or cigar and you uh, pulled it in your mouth and then you blew it out your nose and all of a sudden you have that olfactory overload that's literally the only time i actually felt the heat from the alcohol from the scotch my eyes turned red my nose felt like it was on fire I, it was was amazing like its potency absolutely introduced itself at that time so however you, so you felt like a targaryen oh absolutely <laughs> man it was all there but beyond that i smell this it is peated and again i'm going to emphasize this is not a heavy smoke it's just peated and i love that and that peat the initial peat goes into for me peat brine vanilla and it's a sweet vanilla it's like so layered as you smell it and you pull the glass away or you pull it closer to you and then the oak and then the honey and it's just a teeny little hint of apples i think that's part of the sweetness that really comes out in it on the palate 60 percent abv totally surprising second hits my tongue creamy followed by vanilla that's what she said <laughs> then you mentioned the the minute little bits of citrus from creamy to vanilla to me it goes to brown sugar and this is unexpected for me but i love lime and it goes from brown sugar to lime and then almost a little bit of tangerine and then kind of refinishes to the peat on that true finish though And you get hints of it all along. But on the finish is oak, cinnamon, and nutmeg. And it is a long finish. It's exactly what she's looking for. It is not going to disappoint. It is totally pleasing on the tongue. It is warm. It covers the whole mouth. As you're sipping and tasting your scotches, you uh, make sure... A, as you're smelling them, you leave your mouth slightly open, but then also as you're tasting them, you get it around your whole mouth. And that's what part of the layering process is. And it really brings out all those dynamics from the creamy and the vanilla um, right down to mm, the lime and a hint of tangerine and cinnamon and nutmeg and the cinnamon still there even though the nutmeg is coming out this is a treat um if you can get it at the price point where i ran and grabbed another bottle after uh purchasing after noah purchased this one i was like man that seems like a steal sure enough turns out it was uh it is definitely a special occasion scotch it could be any number of events um, I, you know, I know that I'm going to say I wouldn't share it with my friends, but this is to be somewhat appreciated. Now, don't cover, 
covet the neighbor's wife, so to speak, and thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife. Don't covet this scotch, but do not just go and hand it out thinking that anyone will appreciate it because even though it is a smooth operator, it is also so layered, so vast, so perfect in that sense that it is absolutely undervalued at uh, even $100 a bottle. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I wouldn't share with people. I'm saying I won't share. With, I wouldn't share with people who wouldn't appreciate it. Right, and I I know that. I don't know that they all know that. <laughs> It's time for our shout outs. First shout out, uh, really my big shout out goes to my two kiddos going back to school, excited, doing well, both seem, you know, from what they've communicated with me, they don't need anything, they're doing well, they're thriving, they're having fun, it's always a little intimidating, right? Well, Mila says everything is cool, Aiden is loving, is uh, already his, uh, basketball gym class you know getting ready for the season and i just think it's great that they are getting this opportunity to really be part of society again covid really messed that up all right so my first shout out is it's not really a total shout out really it's just more like uh, an appreciation um i'm really excited and, and i appreciate the fact that college football is getting ready to come back which is probably <laughs> why you see me wearing my cu hat here uh, college football, I think uh, week zero is it might be next weekend um, or this upcoming weekend. And then, uh, but for University of Colorado uh, Buffalo's football, we have a, you know, it's, I think it's almost two weekends. Uh, I think it's uh, two Fridays from now. And it's probably why you see my CU thing here off to the, off to my right. And um, your left is right. Oh, is it? They're left, you're right. Oh, okay, why not? That's why I said my right. <laughs> yeah, you're good. I was just emphasizing to them, you're left, his right. <laughs> <laughs> and the other shout uh, the one that's more of a shout out though is uh is X twenty two report and General Flynn. Uh I just uh I just kinda I think they did a great job of uh General Flynn bringing up some uh some points here that people should be aware of uh that would can or uh, some of the things that uh, the government has been doing that we should all be aware of. And so them trying to get the word out, I think um, I do greatly appreciate that. And one of the things that they're talking about is Executive Order 14067, um, which uh, does bring in um, central bank uh, CBDCs, uh, as well as uh, tying it in with uh, the Chinese social scoring. So, um, so by them... Uh, going out on the limb and trying to get the word out about that i think it's a great thing and um that's why i'm giving them a shout out uh any uh, get it together Zach? oh man where do we start there's so many get togethers this week it's crazy to me so here is an interesting thing just to ponder right uh china who is and has been months to half a year maybe a year ahead of us economically for some time now uh, first with housing then with everything else is in this crunch where they're literally trying to save their own economic potential they're on the verge of collapse and so they're lowering interest rates again so they've dealt with inflation and everything else that we're dealing with they're still dealing with all those things but now they are decreasing the interest rate while we are increasing so I don't know who this should really more so go out to, but if you think about the impacts either way, get it together. That's a good get it together. Uh, mine also has to do a slightly bit with China as well. Let's hear it. So my get it together actually goes out to the American people. <clears throat> Stop Ooh. buying China. <laughs> and what it has to do about here is with a general out of uh, China uh, Chi Hotin, Hotan, it's H A O T I A N. I don't think you pronounced that right. <laughs> Probably didn't, but I'm not Chinese and I don't speak Mandarin. So. He lives in Durango, Colorado, if you're going to bomb anything. <laughs> <laughs> but he uh, warned his listeners uh, in a speech saying that this appears to be shocking, but the logic is actually very simple. The, fun the fundamental conflict with the Western strategic interest uh, cannot be. Uh, consistent with the Chinese interest. So therefore, 
uh, the United States and China cannot co- coexist. And China, due to its uh, soon-to-be collapse uh, industrial-wise and its population growth. Economically, it's in falter. Um, that they're on the verge of a civil war and that they actually need to expand and colonize a new area. They say uh, He goes on to say that the United States will not allow for China to expand and that it, and even at that, even if they were to go into, let's say, the other Asian countries nearby, like Taiwan and stuff like that, that would not give them the type of land that they would need to colonize and, uh, and expand out to. And the three countries that he mentions that they would need to take over in order to expand and colonize is the United States, Canada, and Australia, one of those three. And in order to do that, in order to colonize those areas and take it over, they have to eradicate the people that currently live there through either bio warfare or chemical warfare. You know what's most interesting about that to me? Because we are going to immediately assume they're not going to attack us, right? American pride, ignorance, whatever it shall be. Um, That's the first thing. But the second thing is Australia is actually technically not a nuclear power. No, but apparently it has enough land there for them to expand. And here's right. That's what I'm saying is Australia can't defend itself. No, it probably it can't. But they, and, it's not the yeah. They're just uh, uh, they're the target. And I don't. And honestly, here with that though too, like if you really look at it, it might have enough land mass there. But a lot of it, I don't think, is very livable land mass. So I don't think it's actually a true target. I agree with that because ultimately. You know. I, I think I do think the true target is the United States, but they also know that they can't win a war with the United States if they go with a direct traditional warfare, which is why they listed that the way to take out the populace is through bio and chemical warfare. One possible conspiracy. So the Americans... Not conspiracy. He said it. Right. I'm just saying the one possible conspiracy is their first thwarted attempt was COVID. Now... With that, we would know that. We would not be ignorant. Our technology, we don't know a fraction of it as civilians. There are security clearances way above our head. What would be good countermeasures? What if we put bio labs in places like Ukraine and everywhere around China? Or what if, playing like the devil's advocate here, what if China knows that they can't take over America? So what do they do? They buy out politicians who did build those biolabs in other places so that way they could create those so biolabs like and, and bring them into the United States. Ukraine. Yeah, like you I agree with that. Man, my next get together is, uh, hey, why haven't we seen what the search warrant was for going into Trump's, and you brought this up last week, Florida estate. I, why would, why would, just think about this, why would anyone hide that? If it wasn't something uh, that was all about the next election, um, if it wasn't something that stall time. So Trump's lawyers, also foolish in some ways, but maybe not, have stalled some of this themselves. But now they're trying to get to the point where, hey, let's unseal this. What were you looking for? That's fine. The only reason to keep it sealed is if, A, they took something they weren't supposed to be looking for, or B, it was already a known factoid um so my next get together is hey uh uh, judges juries and executors and also civilians of america like let's get this pushed through good bad or ugly uh if trump's asking for it and gets him arrested because he did something wrong his own bad let's like not stall this let's push it through let's give him what he wants i think everybody should want to see it i do like, what, did, what were they really looking for um, unless it was personal documents that actually incriminated the FBI? Why else would you stall this? For our restaurant review, we went to the Lazy Dog in the Southlands. Yeah, Holder Hell. <laughs> Holy mother of Satan. <laughs> so do you want to start with yours first? Uh, it seems like you have a lot to get no, off your man, chest. I'm going to let you go. You're like, yeah, Lazy Dog. All right. So when we first approached Lazy Dog, it looked like a it looked like a pretty nice establishment on the outside. had a nice big patio. You walk in, it still looked um, aesthetically pleasing on the inside. Uh, the patio was 
pretty pleasing. That's about where it ends. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Uh, after that, uh, being on the patio, um, I'm not sure when it became a thing, but uh, I, you know, I have nothing against dogs, <laughs> but I don't think dogs should be inside of restaurants. I'm, I'm kind of against that. I can understand if someone needs a guide dog because they're blind, but in general, um, I don't think dogs should be in a restaurant, and I do find that to be slightly bit unsanitary. It used to be that way all the time, um, but yet for some reason now people are allowed to bring dogs into patios and restaurants and stuff, and I just don't agree with that. Um, call me an asshole if you want, but that's just the way I feel. Two, uh, <laughs> the service here, I'm not sure if, it's, uh, if they're suffering from COVID or they're understaffed or whatever, but the service sucked. It was freaking terrible. We had to wait for our first beer. We had to wait for our food. And for your second beer, you had to wait over 30 minutes. And I had even had, had to ask the guy like, Dude, at like 15 minutes. 15 yeah. minutes after I ordered my beer, you ordered your beer and you got yours 10 minutes before I got my beer 10 minutes later. <laughs> exactly. Food. <clears throat> okay. So food, we got the, uh, the, our appetizer. We usually get some kind of appetizer to share and, and kind of like talk about. And we got the sweet potato tots. All by themselves, the sweet potato tots tasted okay. But here's where the problem is, is that it was supposed to come with a dipping sauce. And they didn't even bring it out. So we had to ask for that. Once we got the dipping sauce, it made, it made, it made the uh, sweet potato tater tots even better. Then um, I ordered the, we stayed with the appetizer kind of uh, menu there since we were there during happy hour. Which I'm not even really sure that makes a difference since like we barely like the service was so slow and so terrible. Like it pretty much happy hour pretty much expired before we could even get all of our food and all of our drinks. Um, but in any case, I got the um, the lettuce wraps, um, the chicken lettuce wraps. Decent. Um, but if you're going to really get chicken lettuce wraps, I'll say number one, go to... Um, uh, what's that Chinese restaurant? P.F. Chang's, P.F. Chang's. P.F. Chang's. And the other place is the 20 Mile Tap House. 20 Mile Tap House actually had some really <laughs> decent uh, chicken lettuce wraps. Um, then after that, I got what was called the Dirty Dog. And actually, the Dirty Dog, it uh, had a bacon and uh, blue, uh, blue cheese um, dressing on there. Uh, some... Uh, wing sauce and some other stuff on a Nathan's uh, beef hot dog. And it was actually pretty bomb. It was, it did taste pretty good. But the problem here, once again, is how long we had to wait for the food and stuff. So um, ultimately, uh, and even the, the waiter's attitude was kind of, kind of crappy. So all in all, would I take a first date there um, after this first experience? Hell no. <laughs> Unless you want to get dumped. <laughs> but I can see that there has potential. So if they were to clean things up, yeah, maybe. Um, could I meet friends there? Sure. I think it might be a place you can meet friends there, especially if, you, if you're not going to care about your drink showing up on time or if you have like a long time to just sit there and chill and chit-chat and enjoy the weather or something like that. Um, but overall, probably not. So... Uh, overall, I'm going to give this place a five. And I know that seems really harsh, but if they got things cleaned up and they seems got like generous, <laughs> if they got things cleaned up, I think it could be more like a seven or an eight. Yeah, this is where I'm going to jump in. We walked up and it was so promising. It looked so great. You walk up the outside. Of the building looks pleasant, looks calm, looks welcoming and we get in they ask us do you want to sit you know where do you want to sit oh yeah we, we can sit outside that's great because it's a beautiful day for it we go sit outside we order our beers at first the waiter the hostess was great the waiter seemed okay and uh then 10 minutes later we finally get our beers and that's after we waited about 10 minutes to get introduced. A two-hour visit all together for what should have taken 45 minutes to 60 minutes. Uh, we get our first beers and our, you mentioned them, the sweet potato tots. That were supposed to come with the lime aioli sauce. That did not come with the sauce until we asked for it. Yeah, epic fail. Like, make keep it simple. Keep it simple. So simple. They missed half of it. 
didn't keep it simple. Uh, but my first beer, man, I will give them credit for this, man. That Huckleberry IPA, my first beer, dynamite. And as that beer was finished and we went through our different rounds of food, we decided we were just doing appies. We're doing happy hour. We're going to get out of there uh, around six. We didn't get out of there until after seven because of their service and their timelines and still got charged after happy hour prices, even though we ordered happy hour foods during happy hour. The time was that bad. Uh, it was approximately 556 when I ordered my second beer. And then still didn't have it at 6.15. And that's when Noah was like, hey, man, where's this beer? And the guy's like, oh, I'll make sure it's coming. I'll go get it myself. And Noah ordered his Coors Light. Uh, with that, his Coors Light came out 10 minutes later, and I was still waiting for my beer. And then 10 minutes later, I was still waiting for my beer. And then five minutes later, the guy finally delivers it, and he's giving me a dirty look like I'm the problem when I said, hey, you know, like, let's look at the time. Do, does your system tell you when you order the beer? I'm assuming it does because of happy hour pricing, right? And that was really my concern. I'm not trying to be a cheapskate. And he's like, yeah, I know, 30 minutes. It took a long time. We're, You know, it's been really busy. And I'm looking around. I'm like, I haven't seen you active at all. Literally, you've been a ghost. You haven't been great to me. And then he goes back, and this is after we ordered our final round of appetizers. But really, the thing is, it should never take 35 minutes to get a, a beer, especially a $9 beer, which they didn't charge the happy hour price. They gave me a free beer at the wrong price. They charged me the non-happy hour price for the beer I ordered at 5 o'clock when we got there. That's ridiculous. So a $9 beer and waiting 30 minutes for it, ridiculous. He also lied to us. He said he took two beers off, did not. We're looking at this tab. We're like, we ordered a couple of appetizers and four beers. Two of them were supposed to be free. How are we being charged $70? Ridiculous. So for me... Man, Lazy Dog, restaurant and bar, you absolutely failed. Um, the food wasn't bad. The food to me was only a five. And I think one of the things we've talked about lately was being honest. Like this food, I get better tater tots anywhere. I get better, better tater tots at a fast food restaurant, honestly. And I don't have to ask for my sauce. And then the waffle fries, great. I don't have to get attitude from the server dropping him off after he was questioned because it took him 30 minutes to get me my drink, a $9 beer. And he's looking at me like I'm a jerk because I had to pay $9 to get a beer after 30 minutes. No. Um, and then, like literally I had no real win. I have no real win. So the atmosphere was a seven. Like it was, it could have been such a great night. The service was zero. The service, if you could go into the negative, it did that. This is absolutely a detractor. So my overall visit is a four. And literally, I get better service at Taco Bell because I'm not paying $9 for a drink. I'm not being lied to about getting two free drinks because I had to wait 35 minutes for the second one. They're getting the prices right. They're not charging me non-happy hour prices during happy hour. Nothing about this guy was right. And then what really pissed me off was, though, in between me letting him know it's already been 30 minutes, I'm still waiting for my beer, and then bringing our next round of food and beers, him walking by and giving me the look like there's that jerk. And I'm like, no, man, I'm just letting you know. I've been waiting for my beer for 30 minutes. You told me 15 minutes ago when you went to go get his second beer uh, that you were getting when you get my beer, and you failed. So with that, um, get it together, lazy dog with whatever you need to do i don't think it's un unsalvageable i think you can fix it i don't know if this guy is salvageable he may or may not be but at the end of the day get it together smarter, smarter challenge we were to watch the uh time the 2002 time machine starring guy pierce and then discuss what era that we would like to visit. Um, 
What was your first impressions of that movie? So, like, the movie's an hour and 36 minutes long. You take out the credits. It's actually a fairly short movie. It's a pretty quick movie. I don't necessarily love Guy Pierce, but I love the prospect of time travel. So he goes to his own life event and wants to go back and stall that event. And with that, I fully understand. I fully, I, I almost support it, right? But we know that uh, with real world things, there are going to become time ripples and a multiverse. These things will happen so it was a great question from that prospect so with that it's a fun movie guy pierce does a good job uh ironically rotten tomatoes gave it i believe a 48 oh i didn't know dude like the ratings were terrible and that makes sense from the general perspective it wasn't a sexy movie but it was a smart movie and uh, again not necessarily like intelligent that would be like the sexy smart uh but smart enough where it was intricately designed and you have to wonder would i try to go and time travel as an inventor or a scientist if i was given the possibility he ends up going in the future when he's trying to go into the past oops got the timetables wrong hit that bar just a little too hard but with it all of that you learn the lesson of man if you could change time would you yeah so i think uh, and i don't remember the book all that well um i remember reading it a long time ago and i probably should have reread it uh, as well as watched the movie but i just didn't have the time to do that since i was uh, teaching my class this weekend but um what i would say here is that um, I don't remember the book being all that long anyways. And so it, it, it kind of held true to slightly bit of the HG Wells story there. Um, maybe, maybe not totally accurate, but close enough to it. And here's one of the main points that I see in this movie with H uh, with, uh, with this 2002 version is that, um, he played guy, guy Pierce played the, the character, uh, Alexander Hardington. Yes. And, he, he, the reason why he created the time machine and wanted to go back in time is because his, the love of his life happens to get killed. And so he, he actually spends all of his knowledge and he's a very like intelligent person and he's an inventor, a scientist. And he like learns like the probability of like time traveling and creates a time machine to go back in time to save her. And he does, he does go back in time and he, uh, he changes the path of, uh, of where she would have died previously. So he does something different with her. Uh. <laughs> but I think what he learned here is that the universe will act as a universe will act. If she's meant to die, she will die. And I think this, and he realizes that. And I think after he, she dies the second time, through another mishap, which actually, if you kind of watch the first mishap, uh, uh, like before you, the first mishap happens, he's dealing with the guy with a steam engine uh, vehicle. And it's the steam engine vehicle that of the guy that he he talked to before he met her the first time. It's his vehicle that ends up killing her or causes like horses to run over, run her over or something like that. But in any case, uh, here, um, he, he, he finally realizes, yes, I created the time machine, but what good does the time machine do me if I can't go back into the past and change the future as far as, you know, you know, to save the woman I love. And then yes, he, something happens to him. He gets knocked out and ends up like what? 800,000 years in the future. Yeah, I think it is literally almost 800,000 years. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. And what he finds is a bunch of, oh, this is where it gets great because I think this is real. I think it's our past, our present, and our future. Honestly, we've just tried to pretend that's not the case. It's hunters and hunted. Oh, yeah. Well, before we get to the hunters and hunted, he did go into the future because he wanted to see if people had not only – like develop time uh, time travel, but understand why they could not change the past. So when he went to the future, he went so far into the future where um, they were trying to build colonizations up on the moon, and by trying to create foundations or create whatever you know, they're like blowing things up to to create the moon for under underground living. That it destroyed the moon. Which honestly, if you kind of think about it, 
that is a high probability if the if we have the hollow moon theory. Like if you were to There's go no there, way if we have the hollow moon theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we do have the theory. I mean, but if the hollow, if the moon is truly hollow, if they try to go like blow, like blow up and stuff, and try to create things uh, inside the moon, and it's all hollow there, it's possible they could destroy the moon, and then all of a sudden the moon, like, starts falling down onto the earth and stuff like that, and that's when he gets knocked out and goes like eight hundred thousand years in the future, and that's where uh, one species, as Orlando Jones, who's like this uh, supercomputer who knows like all of man's history tells how one race or one species becomes two different species, the hunted versus the hunters hunters. And, uh, he first comes across the hunted, right? The sheep. And, uh, after he, he meets the, the sheep people, if you will, uh, he uh, goes into and finds like kind of like part of the existing Orlando Jones's computer person and he's like what what what's the difference like why this happen here he's like these these people you're hanging out with they're bam he tells them that they're sheep that they're food and um any case what were you gonna say about the hunters and the hunted no that's just it it's just interesting paradigm where you can see the future and past of a theory like the predators aliens versus predators any number of these things but really that is the case ultimately there are alphas in nature and through time whether the earth is going through cycles of global warming it's shown that sign it's through cycles we can visit and acknowledge econ uh, ecologically um, geologically is that this has happened this isn't a first unless you're seeing um you know that there were other generations of humans and we're going to thwart their previous failures of global warming because that's what created the ice age and created golden colorado for example was at one point in time a sunny paradise with palm trees uh not anymore right there's no ocean there but at one time maybe there was if that's the case then if we're trying to thwart a previous civilization a civilization that was that far advanced well, A, first you have to acknowledge we're not the only ones here. And B, uh, where does the potential actually come in? And then also, can you actually really change the future? Or is, to your point, I think this is what's great, global warming and anything else, where's the trajectory? Can you change things uh, by changing sustainability? Because ultimately, with and we have talked about this on previous episodes. We've got this MIT computer telling us in 1972 that we can't sustain life as we know it more than a century. But then we're telling people not to sustain life individually. We're telling them we all have to work together. That's literally the opposite of self-sustainability. Um, and it doesn't make sense. So here's a really interesting part. Um, before I really, really want to get to like the other questions here I want to ask is that once uh, he does go into the future, you have the hunters and the hunted. The hunted are very uneducated. They don't, uh, they don't really know much of anything. Like they lack knowledge. But the Morlocks, the ones, the humans. Dude, the Morlocks are the awesomes. <laughs> the Morlocks, which uh, are the hunters, they live underground and they never actually came up out of under the ground after like the moon had split apart and all that other stuff and things got back to like more of a stable um stable area for uh, for the um, for the environment uh, but in any case what they did though is i think the morlocks actually became more intelligent uh because they had like the uber morlock which is like the brain morlocks and he was actually probably more intelligent than Guy Pierce was, and um, I think it's kind of kind of interesting how these super brain Morlocks, which were called the Uber Morlocks, uh, developed the other types of Morlocks. For that. They created the, the hunters and the workers and stuff like that, and they also kind of basically set up the hunted normal people that we that like Guy Pierce came across as being the food. Uh, I just find it very interesting, like how they became like he's able, like these Uber Morlocks were able to control the other Morlocks and penetrate uh, 
the minds of other people. <laughs> it's a brave new world. <laughs> so the question here, and I think we talked about this too uh, in the past, is that men do things for women. Or other men. <laughs> and, and here's what I mean by this. Like, Guy Pierce, I'm not sure he would have created the time machine if he did not want to go back and save his his fiance. But at the same time, when he goes into the future, he meets another girl, part of the food chain people. Ooh la la. <laughs> and he uh the Uber Morlock says, Here's your machine, uh here's fixes your answer, it. fixes it, here's here's your answer that you're looking for. And then Guy Pierce actually goes into the future sees what the future is like and then he goes back to where the the girl that he likes from the future and saves her and he wants and his whole thing is that he wants to change the future so it doesn't end up being the morlocks ruling the world and it, he i think he was driven in both cases because of a woman I, and i i'm not sure which episode it was maybe a couple episodes back you mentioned something about how men uh, do things for women. I mean, I don't remember what you exactly said. Do you remember? I don't remember exactly what I said, but no, there are many times that uh, our footprint prints are misplaced doing things for the wrong reason or the right reason. But yes, we are often driven, men are often driven by pleasing a woman instead of doing what's best for their own sustainability. And I think men get kind of crapped on especially in society today um like talking about like how you have toxic toxic masculinity and things like that and really women don't go out there and they're not working the same kinds of jobs that men are doing um what do you do you remember who that uh uh that professor is out of canada that talks about men and women and uh the differential and pay and stuff like that um, I know who you're talking about. I don't remember his name at the moment, but he absolutely really talks about how we are all judged differently, yet there are sides expecting we all get paid equally, even though we are not expected to work equally. Right, and I think he also brings up the point like how like more men uh, uh, um, commit suicide than women. That's just a fact. He said that lots of people have said that lots of scientists throughout time, particularly middle-aged, the greatest factor being middle-aged white men. Exactly. But middle-aged men in general uh, who are expected to deliver results it, it come to this forefront where they're like, hey, this is my only out. Suicide. I got a life insurance policy. They'll get paid and I don't have to suffer anymore. And that's really the tragedy to me is that's their fail to all these men who do this is not that they're not being right in the sense of the expectations are overwhelming on them, but it's that they haven't built the relationships because society has focused them in different directions throughout their time or they have focused themselves on different directions. They haven't had the right mentors or anything else. Um, for me, and you've actually commented on this, Noah, and I, I actually really appreciate that. My time with my kids is my most precious time on this planet right now, and most likely forever, but um, it is my most precious time. And it is actually one of the things that keeps me sound and balanced. Me, Lynn Aiden, if you're hearing this, know that uh, those times we go on hikes or we go to the store or to Taco Bell or uh, to Panda Express, those times are the most valuable times of my life because I get to spend those that time with you one-on-one -on -one and have conversations, little things uh, no different than when we have our Friday uh, a nacho night and ice cream and watch our movies or go to the theater and do the same. We don't have to say a whole lot, but those are the things that keep me going, that keep me working 50, 60 hour weeks, that keep me focused on uh, bettering the world not just myself, but bettering myself, my work, and the world so that you have a better world to live on. And I don't think society is set up to help men understand that that is a potential for them, that it's not just about, let's say you're a business worker and you're selling stocks. It's not just about selling stocks. It's about are you selling stocks you believe in? And, man, there's so many tangents we could go on there. I could talk <laughs> about that for 
40 hours and never stop we'd be like uh 12th bottle of van Riog batch number two now but really it's one of those things where you have to find this medium balance and in life i do truly try to make the world a better place and it's so funny to me we also talked about this now uh, i've talked about this with many people i only take the trash can out probably once every six weeks for the trash man to pick up because at that point it's full and all these people driving electric cars that I've talked to and I'm like, yeah, I only take it out every six weeks. How often do you take it out? And they're like, well, every week. And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, because I pay for it. It's like, but wait a minute, you're going to pay for it either way. So if it's not full, why are you having them waste petrol because you're driving an electric car? Why are you going to have them waste an extra minute of petrol while they're emptying the trash dumpster with their machine into their vehicle and then driving to the next house and doing the same you know why don't you just talk to your neighbors even if you guys pick one out of five houses how much petrol and how much energy does it save and how much better does it make the world based on your values and your thoughts with the electric car thing if you're not burning all these fossil oh no i still pay for it every week i'm gonna, I'm gonna keep doing it what like where did you lose sight of you're driving an electric car why uh well because you can say you drove an electric car so now take that beyond oh no 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 i'm driving an electric. Well, what i think that i think the big disconnect here anyways is that they don't even realize that their 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 electric car uses just as much energy if not more even if you negate that like my point is like let's take that off the table and just point out you're trying to say you're bettering the earth by reducing the use of fossil fuels even though your electric car may not be where are you going beyond that and then it stops oh no i've done my part but that's Uh. what i'm saying They're, they're, they're i'm just saying that's what i'm saying is like their logic is already skewed it's not their logic is not sound to begin with Agreed. And, and I think Agreed. that's the reason why they can say, yeah, I'm going to put my, put out my trash every week anyways, is because already they're thinking that they're lowering the carbon, their carbon footprint, which they're not. They've actually increased it. And they, they, they just, even though they say that they're doing that, they're really not. And I think that's, you know, that's why I think their, their, their base logic is, is false. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with that. And it's just interesting, like, really think about what you're doing to improve not just your world, but the world if you're trying to improve the world. If you're saying you're getting an electric car to improve the world, don't just do it so you get your one-time tax credit. Any case, I think we got a little bit sidetracked. It was more about, like, what men do for women and how it is unappreciated and how we, like, uh, we go out to be like protectors and we want to serve and, and really uphold women no, in our lives. I, I think that it did go on at tangents, but it stayed fully in line because women make our babies that we make and then we go out of our way to protect them and the future and how many people are like okay i've done the first step but you know what these next nine steps i'm done (laughs) right all right so so that was the like the one question i I wanted to kind of talk about our topic i want to talk about with this but we had to get to that point and talk about this about the story first the second one is if you could go back anywhere in time where would you want to visit and why now you say visit visit what is the purpose of the visit i would say more for just to view or to actually potentially change no i say to view okay i think the change would be uh too astronomical of a feat to do because you're going to be causing ripple effects right well i mean appropriate even just your presence there is going to create that just they say i'm just saying the ripple yeah, it's effect. more about going back in time to become an observer to view okay so with that i'm not going to go try to change any of the mistakes i've made in my own life here's why it's already a mistake i can't change i don't want to revisit it what i will do is i'll go back and see my children's births and revisit them and remember how great that was uh because if you're going to go back in time let's stick to the good let's not revisit the past which you're only going to magnify in your mind at that point and make even worse so i want to go back and uh remember that my uh, brother-in-law at the time took a picture of mila right after she was born and she opened her eyes and smiled at me i want to go revisit that and i want to go revisit um aiden's first basketball hoop in the game i want to do those two things because not that i don't want to revisit aiden's birth but i want to remember the moments of joy which i think were mutual and uh yeah 
Okay. You can only revisit the joy. Otherwise, you're going to bring yourself down if you can't make an impact without making it worse. Oh, that's going to be a tough one to top. I don't think I can top this one. I mean, because it's so it's so personable and uh, it's it's so like self uh, reflective and stuff. And and um, yeah, like for me, I was looking more like in a historical view. <laughs> uh, but, but then, but then again, I mean that that is a historical view for you because right. you, that's that's your life and that's your kids. I don't have kids, so I can't like say like, yeah, I want to do something similar to that. So for me personally, um, it's more about a historical point of view from like history as a whole. I, I think it would be kind of cool to go back into time and witness or observe the roar, the roaring twenties. Um, oh, that would be my time too. But <laughs> like, I mean, j just to see, like, if all you can do is view and you can't interact, <laughs> that's where it gets tough. But absolutely, five hundred percent impossible. One hundred percent, don't know. That's I'd be there at your shoulder. Um, so I think it'd be great to see, like, the speakeasy, the flapper girls, the the uh, kind of like almost like the heyday of the mafia. What the Great Gatsby was written about. Yes, exactly. Yeah, hell yeah. Now, okay, so you brought up a point here. I, I talked about a, a time frame to observe. What time frame would you go back to to live? Not to alter the future or anything like that, but let, let's say you go back in time, you forget anything that happens in the future, but when you go back in time, that's where you would live and experience. I would probably go back to the same time. And uh, the reason for that is because the potential was almost unlimited. Life was real no one's saying it was easy but it was real it yeah no one's gonna say it's easy none of these time frames are easy even the time that we live in is not easy definitely not going back to the hippie days i don't believe in the whole like free love hey 12th hole in one <laughs> today <laughs> so i think here's a little bit a little bit tough for me though because i think although i said the roaring 20s it would be a place for me to go back and observe i think it would be kind of fun experience um to live during that time frame and experience that time frame but you got to remember you're like you're kind of like that's on the tail end of like the great pretty depression. sure i can pull off a mobster okay <laughs> like you're talking about great depression talking about world war ii right around that same time era but really the roaring 20s i think it would be an excellent time <laughs> to to like to to experience and live in bring some scotch from scotland during prohibition also i think the other kind of sort of time frame um that i probably would would probably want to to live through maybe is the old west see i was gonna say american indian so that's so interesting because, because i think it's actually the same time period just different sides i well and he, i'm not that's necessarily saying like as an indian or as a cowboy but during like living during the old west i think you have more of that like the you get that that freedom that um like the government hasn't really like had its claws in the old west and you know you live by the gun you die by the gun and type of stuff like i think just uh that type of um that freedom and expansionism and um and stuff would be uh, interesting to experience it'd be rough life though it would be and it's, uh, so many of my ancestors were from that life I actually I love and enjoy the thought of uh, living uh, among a Navajo tribe and seeing what that would be like. I that, really do. That that would be yeah. I'm sure that that'd be really interesting. Um, that kind of reminds me of that old movie, A uh, Man Named Horse, or something like that. <laughs> the white guy goes lives with the Indians. I'm not that white. <laughs> oh, I got. I'm you. not saying you. I'm saying I know. Like, I was just being funny for a second. Um, all right, here's one more. Uh, we'll, we'll do one more here unless, so you, got, unless, uh, unless no. you got a question. If you had like a moment in time that had nothing to do with a personal life, just to observe an outsider, I've got it, but go for yours. All right. So here's, here's another one. Um, if you were to go back in time, what historical figure would you want to interview or have dinner with? Perfect. Michael Schumacher, right after he won the 2000 e e Formula One World Championship. 
That's awesome. Dude, no, seriously, this no, guy. I'm that's awesome. I know. I And I know you've got found a new appreciation for Formula One. Uh, just the money, the politics, everything that goes into this, the technology and everything, um, the changing world and how they're continually having to adapt to stay current. Um, America super involved right now. we got to go to the Vegas Grand Prix next year if we can. But with that, um, man, the guy won the world championship and then came to ferrari in 1996 so in 94 95 he won the world championship for renault and then he comes to ferrari and has to fight for it i have this is why i struggle with any current modern formula one champion lewis hamilton in particular michael schumacher left and then came and struggled through 96 97 98 99 and then finally in 2000, won a Formula One World Championship with Ferrari. And then again in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005. Five years plus the two previous. And he struggled though. Like every inch he earned. I don't know that many champions do that. I think Tom Brady is the other one that I really appreciate for that. And I don't know what the hell is going on with him this year, but hopefully he figures his life out and does what he wants to do. The guy didn't need to come back. He could have stayed retired. Right. He's already in my mind, the goat with that. Michael Schumacher, the goat of formula one. I would have loved to interview him after that. And you can actually go online and see a lot of interviews, read books, do different things. And after he retired from Ferrari, his book literally spells it out. He's like, man, my family has supported me so much. All I want to do is go support my wife, Karina, Karina Schumacher. And I'm not saying she's not attractive. She's not attractive to me um, as far as she's not a supermodel. He could have had any of them. And he's the first billionaire athlete, BTW. And with that, he just wanted to support her the way she had supported him. I've got no greater fondness for someone who is so humble as the first billionaire athlete, as the greatest Formula One world driver of all time that also appreciates his family. I don't know that I know anyone like that. So basically, from my understanding, number one would be Michael Schumacher. Maybe number two might be... Tom Brady? Dude, Tom Brady would be a, a, a cool one to go interview. Michael Schumacher would be number one. I don't know that Tom Brady would be number two. Um, man, I might go back to like uh, Washington or Lincoln for number okay. two. So my number one uh, would probably be Caesar. Ooh. Julius? Julius Caesar. Just checking. Yeah. Been a few yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah, Julius Caesar, the, the one everyone knows. Uh <laughs> I think it'd be interesting to see how, you know, like his thoughts, his process of like through like warfare and through um, um, how he lived his life and, and became a politician and things like that. His model still hands true to today for business and warfare. Exactly. And then the second person, uh, which is a, a tight number two and probably, probably very controversial would be Hitler. Oh, that's a good one. Like within my top 10 is actually current Verstappen. <laughs> I would love to interview Verstappen after he won his Formula One World Championship last year. Like, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Throw it out there. I right. should have been the happiest man on the planet that day. He deserved it. So um, those would be my two that I would want to go back in time in history to interview or have dinner with. Um, how about uh, you said you you said you had one other that you would do? Or, or? Here's the tricky one is uh, man Kennedy. Ooh, Kennedy the night before his assassination, and just okay. really get his views and just have. I I can't believe he went into that situation not knowing that that was possible to happen, and I would love to hear his real world view of. I can't stop it. Because anyone who's as smart as that, who's already acknowledged as he had at that point, there are extraterrestrial life forms and all these different things, has also acknowledged time travel and anything else. Like, just be real. Be open to it. I think he was, and I think he was also beyond that as 
the time traveler, the time machine would respond. You can stall time, but ultimately atoms will realign. So you can explode a chunk of gold, but over time it will attract to itself again. I think uh, another point in time in history that I probably would like to observe would be uh, on the day that the Japanese bombed uh, Hawaii. Oh. Uh, because on that day, uh, my grandfather, who was 17 years old, living in Honolulu, Holy. ran from basically Punch Bowl Cemetery area to uh, one of the naval recruiting areas. And he was only 17 years old and lied, saying he was 18 so he could join the Navy. I think it would be interesting uh, from a family perspective to see the, what happened during that time frame of the bombing of Japan. Or, I mean, the bombing of Honolulu by Japan. Yeah. Um, maybe, but, maybe, maybe. We got a bomb coming. Well, we know what ultimately happens. Well, yeah, we know what ultimately happens. Obviously, he didn't die, so obviously, I'm here. So, <laughs> but you might have already been created. <laughs> I doubt that. I mean, he might have been like, I'm 12. I'm going to die now. <laughs> that was my grandfather, so that would be my dad before me. So. Just saying, every four years, they're <laughs> popping out babies. Who knows? Uh, any case, uh, is there anything else in history or time machine wise that you would like to touch upon? Oh, it, it's countless. It's literally countless. And I think it all comes down to me largely. Um, historically, it's also normally attached to the yard. So I'd love to go talk to Hemingway Ooh. when he's writing a great book or Picasso Ooh, when really he's one. painting Gallardo. Um, some of these different things, um, some of their famous works and also some of their not so famous works, uh, Picasso's blue period. I'd love to go talk to him about some of those things. Uh, don't forget f Monet almost dropped an F bomb. Uh, I'm not saying we're the U S for maybe Japan. Salvador Dali, but yeah, for you, Dolly. So for me, though, Monet, I'm mean, like, hey, man, what was it like? Like, your life hasn't been easy, but what was it really like? And how does an artist, did he just, like, get super depressed or what? Like, or did he not care? Was he socially disembarked? Um, some of those things would be great. I'd love to go see. Oh, man. What would it be like to see and go talk to the author of the first Batman, the first Superman, the first any of those. So last week, I think you made a great point here. This would be another one I would like to go probably experience and observe. The building of the pyramids. Well, hell yeah. <laughs> and then what about like Stan Lee? Like when did you decide you were going to do this? But the building of the pyramids is just the beginning. Aztecs? Aztecs, yep. Um, so much. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I think this was a fun topic. Thank you for um, for discussing this with me. And um, what what is our topic for next week? All right. So we're going to go a little old school and a little simple. But we're going to really talk about Weird Science, the movie from oh, our I youth. I love that movie. <laughs> Weird Science. <laughs> so we're going to do. Robert Downey Jr. So oh awesome. Oh, my movie. God. Also, probably. Anthony Michael Hall. Yes. Shit. <laughs> Bill you Paxton. Got, you got the hottie. So, uh, oh, Kelly LeBrock. Well, yeah, dude. The end of Steven Seagal. So next week we will do Glenn Scotia. 15 year. We'll do a movie review of Weird Science. Weird Science. And then how did that Im impact our lives? Really part of it is I wanted the movie review, like how much fun it is. And then also like how has it taken us from when that movie came out to now? What are things that we would say because of that movie, we have viewed differently, and I know there are a couple at least, at least for me, Kelly Rock being one of them. But you know, your average at high school orgy, <laughs> candle wax on the nipples, whips and chains. Like, fuck. who doesn't love that movie? Anyone who was born in the last 10 years. So, with that, um, weird science, Glenn Scotia, 15 year, and uh, yeah, we're gonna have some fun. Uh, I'm excited for that one. Dude, I am to you. So remember, drink responsibly. So for us, that means if we're drinking more than a dram, we drink at home, no driving. Anything else you want to say to the people other than that? You know, please continue to give us feedback. We do appreciate it. Um, give us ideas on topics you'd like us to cover. Or if there's a scotch you want us to cover, life is great. Let's have fun. Love that. Um 
for uh, for those of you who watch us on YouTube and Rumble, thank you very much for being uh, supporters there. For those of you who listen to us and any one of our number of other uh, formats, thank you for for listening to us. You guys are are, are great. Um, we had our best month ever last month in July. Uh, in fact, this month we are projected to be higher than what we were uh, last month. So that's incredible as well. Uh, so we do greatly appreciate all of you listeners out there and all those of you who subscribe to our channel. Uh, thank you very much. We do greatly appreciate that. Um, if you do want to become a, a patron member and and help us out, uh, just take that very first link down below in the description area to the uh uh, pod being patron and just become a member for a minimum of one dollar a month and that just all goes to us helping out like either procure new uh scotches or rent out theaters for a movie theater night uh for a movie night or any such things as that uh but it does go back uh, to our podcast here uh with that thank you everyone hopefully you have a wonderful week and a great night and Scotchman. Cheers. We hope you enjoyed this evening's episode of Scotch Hour. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you have not done so already, please become a patron member with memberships starting as low as $1 a month. Thank you, and hopefully, you have a wonderful evening.